welcome to work my left side uh i am pumped to announce this week i am chatting to the one the only mr simon hill how are we going mate good yeah good thank you man thank you for having me dude i know this has been a long time in the making but we finally got to finally got to make it happen exactly yeah it's been a few months since we talked about it and then obviously scheduling and just other stuff but yeah here we are i finally get to uh, to chat to you so you know, Mr. Two-time Award of the Presenter of the Year nominee, a radio radio award winner, um, dude. You know, hey. I feel very humbled to just be just be talking to you, dude. Ah, oh, thank you, man. Yeah, you're too kind. Um, you know, those those things are you know that they're, they're nice to talk about, but it's all about just you know doing the job and having fun whilst you're doing it. You know, exactly. That's it. So, um. Well, let's talk about the, well, we're obviously here for, for wrestling more than anything else. Um, you obviously have a love of wrestling, you know, you've done the commentary thing, uh, you've been involved in the business. Um, how did that come about? Is it something that you just sort of fell into? Is it through people that you knew or what was the correct? Um, yeah, you know what, it, it goes right back to just being a fan. Um I was a fan of wrestling probably from like the age of, I mean, the early days, you know, watching superstars on a Saturday morning, uh, you know, going right back. And then when the attitude era kicked, kicked in, I was kind of like 13, 14 and everyone was watching it at school. So I was like, okay, I need to check this out. I need to be in with the cool kids. Everyone's talking about it. And I watched one hour of raw because my grandparents wouldn't let me stay up for the for the entirety of it the first time round, and i was like oh my i just couldn't believe what i was watching so yeah complete mind blown and um and from then on every weekend without fail it didn't matter what my family were doing whatever was happening i was staying at my grandparents that weekend because i had sky or cable back then um so i was watching raw every week and uh even like the pay-per-views you know the old vhs's my nan would record them for me i'd get them the next day run home after school put them on and that would be it be it for the day and, and i was always just such a big big fan and then i did lose a little bit of love for it at one point um i think just after like the ruthless aggression era when it kind of just got a bit more comedic yeah it, it did take a bit of a nosedive but um you know, and, the, and then and then pick back up. But I was always, because of what I've done throughout my career, working in radio and broadcasting in general, I always wondered how how do I work in wrestling? How does that how does it happen? I didn't even know that there was a lot going on in in the British scene at at, at the time, and I thought, do you know what? I I reckon I could do this, and I want to give it a go. So I my sister knew somebody down south um who ran a uh camp promotion and they were like you know she's like I, I, my brother's a presenter like you know he really wants to kind of get into the business and learn about it and they were like well get him to come and ring and announce our next show so i did um you know and the first person i ever ring announced was johnny storm <laughs> so yeah that was a good way to kick things off. <laughs> uh, and and yeah, it kind of just happened from there. And then it was just a lot of research and reaching out to a lot of people. And TNT were the first ones to message back. Um, WAW at the time also did, but I didn't end up doing anything with them. But uh, TNT got me in straight away. And, you know, I became their, their face of the socials, I guess. And um you know all the backstage interviews and things like that and it just kind of snowballed and then i focused on when odyssey gave me the opportunity to commentate i think this is just because <laughs> so they've they've attributed it to the success of keep it locked which was a podcast i was hosting at the time interviewing various stars and stuff and they loved that style and wanted that on commentary so i was like okay so that's how I got into it, and the rest has just been a—it's been a journey, <laughs> to say the least. 
That's, I mean, yeah, that's that's a great way to get in. Um, obviously, yeah, first announcement: the the Wonder Kid, Johnny Storm. You know, straight in, big name, big personality, yeah. a great guy. Uh, but then, obviously, yeah, TNT, Odyssey, two very good promotions. Odyssey, definitely, dude. That must have been a very weird experience because we always joke about wrestling is still real in Morecambe. <laughs> yeah. like, uh, witnessing an, an, an Odyssey show is is an experience it is indeed and there is no crowd anywhere else that i've worked up and down this country and further that is quite like a morgan crowd uh they are invested passionate loud from start to finish and um you know if they don't like you they're gonna let you know yeah i think i was talking to somebody last week and they said they went to an odyssey show with and one of their mates had a lance rivera t-shirt and then they yeah. got you and be like, what are you wearing that T-shirt for? So, I like the guy. He's like, no, not here. We don't make not here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still remember when Ryan Hunter um, had turned on the fans and decided to join the spotlight. People that, uh, before the show, had bought his T-shirt. <clears throat> and um, he, 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 he had this big turn at the end of the show. And I physically witnessed three to four people rip these shirts off, throw them on the ground. This one woman was stomping down on this T-shirt that she brought and wanted a refund. Right. That's how it. passionate they are. <laughs> I just, I love that though, because that just kind of reminds me, like I say, of the old school, you know, the ter- uh, t- uh, territories, you know, like the oh, uh, W, like mid nineties, you know, just that kind of genuine heat and. Yeah. Um, just like kayfabe is still alive you know it's just so much easier to invest emotionally when kayfabe you know exists oh man 100 percent. you know like I, I remember with wcw and the nwo like you know with with all that i remember being a kid and absolutely screaming at my tv you know i would love to have that level of belief again you know and sometimes it's it's there in the understanding like you know of who you should love and who you shouldn't but you know to to i i definitely me and my sister have this conversation all the time when when we grew up we had the best of everything we had the best cartoons we had the best tv shows we had the best books the best games we had the best era of wrestling as well um and i think because of that era of wrestling in particular from that transition of the late 80s to the 90s through the Attitude Era, there was nothing like it. And I don't think wrestling will ever have that feeling ever again. Um, It's very different. It's so good and passionate and we love it. But if you didn't experience that back then, you know, that was special. And I think that's why, you know, everyone still tries to kind of recapture it or it gets referenced so much or it's paid homage to. Because yeah. uh, that was, like you said, that was the peak. You know, it's it could be making more money than it is. No, it's making more money now probably than it was then. But the people's perception is different. You know, yeah. all eyes were on the eyes at that point, you know. Yeah. Um, people like The Rock, Austin and guys like that, they were household names. Yeah, hundred percent. And you know, I, I religiously, I was such a fanboy of the Rock as well. Um, but you know, for me, dude, like, people have this little argument still of AEW or WWE or you know, Impact or TNA now. Thank God they've gone back. Um, you know, it's like, does it really matter? Like, enjoy the wrestling. Like, I used to watch WCW before Raw. <clears throat> because it was a different show i knew i was going to get people kicking the out of each other on wcw but then when i watched raw i knew i was going to be entertained in a totally different way than what wcw could offer me i loved both yeah that's that's right i've I've had this conversation so many times with people it's like it's not football or it's not rugby or it's not it's not a you know some other sport where you've just got to pick one and stay loyal you know just enjoy it as uh, across the board yeah Uh, you know, you know, you've witnessed many shows. Um, like a good wrestling show should be like a circus. You're not going to enjoy. Well, you might do. You might get lucky every now and again. Enjoy, you know, everything across the board. Yeah. 
but there's going to be some stuff you don't like that other people do and vice versa yeah and how it is with like promotions i don't like everything wwe does i don't like everything AEW does but i enjoy what i like and i'm watching yeah. it yeah and that's what it's all about it's subjective isn't it and it's about you know just being invested in what you enjoy and and if you don't enjoy certain parts of it that's fine as well like you know it doesn't mean that every other person has to feel that way exactly that's the one and uh, and that's what you talk about you know if everybody likes the same stuff you will be able to talk about it because you already know about it that's yeah, yeah. Uh, um obviously you mentioned you know the, the podcast um what again you know what kind of made you think right obviously i know why i, I do this um what, what was your reason behind i'm going to start talking to people you know in wrestling um i think it was a, a double barrel thing obviously it started and launched in covid um and i also wanted to find a way of growing my own um excuse me notoriety within wrestling uh, so I was like, how do I build a profile of who I am, what I'm about, what I'm good at and what I can offer? And <clears throat> what I can offer is a platform for others to talk about their experiences through what I'm good at, which is being able to communicate in a way that structures an interview and gives them a platform to shine at the you know level I want. And... So I was like, right, okay, let's try and figure out how this happens. And obviously we all had way too much time on our hands during COVID. And I decided decided to launch um, Keep It Locked. And I just carried it on and um, it got way bigger than I ever thought it would be. Um, So you can imagine when, you know, because I remember when I did the second season, I kicked things off with, Aoife Valkyrie, Aikid, and someone else, Chase Owens. And those are my first three guests. And I was just like, I, I, looking at the numbers and the charts came out. And I remember being number four in the world uh, for sports podcasts behind Jim Ross. And I was like... Yeah, I was just like this. I've I've still got the screenshot. I'll send it to you in a minute. Um, and I was just like, oh my god, like what is going on? And that that was like the pinnacle. But to be quite honest, like, and I haven't announced this anywhere. I just kind of slowly did it. But I have made keep it like dormant now. Um, so it it, it is over. Um, for the foreseeable, I did think about bringing it back. I even got you know. British wrestling's uh, graphic guru, Elliot, to redesign all the artwork for me, which he did, and it looks incredible. But I think with where my career is going and how much time all of that is taking up, I just wouldn't be able to put out the same level of detail and put the same amount of effort in that I did before because I'm too busy to put that time in. So I thought, you know what, I'd rather not, do it half baked and just, you know, yeah. Not do if it. hundred <laughs> percent. Then yeah, you don't want you don't want to insult anyone by half arsing it basically. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah, and you know, I'd rather if I was going to do it, make sure that the talent that I'm offering that platform to are getting the best uh, experience that they can possibly get. So um, yeah, so as as of now, it is dormant. However, you know, look, it was. It was one of the best things, most challenging things I've ever done. And as you well know, dude, like, you know, doing this research takes so, so long, especially when you're talking to like, you know, when, when I'm when I'm having people like Chase Owens on or or La Rebellion or, or these WWE stars, whoever it was, like Rosemary, I remember Impact got in touch and was like, we want you to do one with Rosemary, but she's going to be in gimmick. So... Um, I was like, okay, that's really cool. Because myself and Rosemary had been talking about doing a, a podcast for ages, like six to eight months, and we were trying to make it work. Uh, and she's such a sweetheart. Sorry to bear the gimmick. Um, but uh, yeah, so we we did this anyway. And obviously, we're like my level of research, I'm always so thorough. 
and I addressed her in a particular way that only only die hard hardcore rosemary fans would know um i went right back into the archives and and she popped for it on screen and i was like okay that's it now that's yeah if nothing else happens in this interview that's that's all i needed <laughs> I like, that's it yeah Yo. and yeah that's it i really lost you from doing this it's always nice just to it's nice to get a genuine reaction out of people that you're talking to as well because it is just you know, it makes you feel good that you've actually acknowledged something that they probably didn't even know that you knew about or not yeah. many people know about. And it's just like, ah, okay, that was cool. That was very cool. So... Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And and Hyan was another one of those because I went right back into the sort of stuff that she's into, which is she's a huge gaming nerd, um, you know, and a huge Zelda fan. Uh, so I went right back and we... So we did the interview, which is quite a long one, but we stayed for about 45 minutes afterwards just chatting Zelda, games, films, like pop culture. And um, and because I'd done my research, I kind of knew the sort of stuff she was into. Uh, so again, she was one of those. And I think I, during the interview, she actually said like, oh my God, how much research have you done? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, not not staying up till three AM trying to find little bits that no one else has talked about at all. No, and I mean obviously it pays off because you know I'm doing what I'm doing here and it's it's nice and steady. But dude, yeah, you kind of hit the ground running and it, you know keep it locked. Like you said, man, you've done before. You know, just behind Jr. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. an amazing accomplishment, dude. So you know, kudos on that. Thank so, you, man. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely one I'll be able to. You know, that's that's something I'll hold on to for for the rest of my life for sure. I'd get it your profile underneath. You know, the uh, two-time presenter of the year nominee, radio award winner. <laughs> you know, radio presenter, commentator. Uh, you know, you've got. I don't even think there'd be a profile big enough. No, no, I don't like. I think the characters will run out pretty quickly. Um, yeah, I think I think even Twitter will message me back or X, whatever it is these days. We'll just be like, look, you got to stop ego tripping now. Like, it's too much on your bio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, well, talk of entire Valkyrie is the name you just mentioned. How was that chat? Because that's somebody who is has, has probably got more than a shed load of stories to be told. She's she's been around and done a lot of stuff. Yeah, there's. I mean, you know, there's. There's a lot of great talent and a lot of great stories out there, um, you know, that I was really privileged to be, you know, a part of in terms of some of them were the first time that I'd ever told these stories. And for me to somehow figure out how to get that out of them um, was really cool, like a really, really cool moment. And, um, you know, there's... I never really had a bad experience with the podcast. There's one individual in particular that I won't mention because he's a very, very high profile name um, who was a little bit cocky off camera and a little bit belittling. But um, once the interview happened, he realized I was actually very good at my job. Um, but yeah, you know, I won't say anymore. But um yeah you know apart from that everything was was amazing and um you know i always felt that especially with the women because i remember i had candy floss on as well and Eva valkyrie had she'd never done a podcast and she was so shy and you can see at the start of the podcast as well that she's really timid and i'm just trying to bring it out and the more we go on the livelier she's getting and it's yeah she's starting to tell these stories then that are going on and um i remember because so i i i ended up interviewing debbie kaitel as well so i messaged e for valkyrie at just before the interview i was like look give me some dirt on debbie because you know i'm going to interview her next week and she did um so i ended up talking about stuff to debbie that debbie had never spoken to anyone <laughs> about so it was it was so cool uh, to have those moments and again it kind of helped me gain relationships with a lot of talent especially on the british scene um 
you know, and earn their respect as well, which was nice because, again, it was just that moment of being able to offer them a platform to still talk about themselves because they weren't able to wrestle at the time um, and keep promoting them and, and things like that. So, yeah, you know, I, I could I could sit here all day, dude, and tell you stories from each episode um, and and they would go on for days. Uh, you know, the last the last episode was La Rebellion, um, Mecha Wolf and Bestia. Well, the good thing there is, you know, myself and Mecha are very, very close friends and I already knew a lot of shit about him. So, <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. I was just throwing out the line and he'd bite every time. So, um, you know, and they just been crowned NWA tag team champions for the first time i think um so yeah um that was but the 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 difficult the hardest part with that one is i'd literally just gone through a breakup and uh mecha wolf whatsapps me and goes bro i hope you're okay that was such a cool interview but you look so sad (laughs) 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 um yeah, he messaged my sister and was like, "Can you just keep an eye on Sai, please? Because he's, uh, yeah, he, he he doesn't look good." Thanks, <laughs> Joe. Oh, nice oh you. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's good when you get to talk to mates, right? You mentioned to me beforehand. I'm gonna. You've just drunk the drink, so I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna question it because you mentioned you've got nine days to get into shape. What's going on in nine days? I am off to mexico i'm on holiday um so yeah myself and leah raven we are going to mexico dream holiday um i am (laughs) yeah drinking this horrific looking drink um which is only it's just banana and protein powder that's all it is um but uh yeah i've been training like extra hard i'm a gym addict anyway um i've always been such a fitness freak um you know a, a lot of my mates um and in fact it's actually started to get around british wrestling now the simon hill pose um <laughs> on instagram because i put a lot of gym selfies up on my stories and there's a specific pose that i seem to do all the time and now like you know when we turn up at future shock you've got bailey a pele uh, all these guys are doing the simon hill pose uh when i walk through the, the doors and stuff and um yeah you know danny proper has has done it at shows and stuff so it's um yeah it's it's got around but yeah i'm i'm focused extra extra hard uh i've joined a new gym and stuff recently so it's given me a bit of a different perspective so i'm on this diet now she'll kill me for this leah raven is a foodie right now all now, bear in mind she's an athlete and a champion and a very good athlete at that. But that girl will sit there, avoid all three meals of the day as long as she can have cake, biscuits with a tea, and a pack of crisps. Like it, 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 this girl's diet blows my mind. But then she can still run around the ring the way she does. And um, and me the the other side, like I'm counting my calories, you know, I'm getting my pro- protein in every day, counting my macros, uh, you know, gym in every um, you know, and I'm just they're just like your metabolism is just baffling. Like <laughs> some people are just born lucky, dude. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah, man. You know, she she's she's younger than me as well, so I guess, you know, youth is on her side. Yes. Uh, the metabolism is still young it's still energetic it's still buzzing around whereas yeah as the years go on your metabolism starts just i can't be asked anymore and it, <laughs> yeah <laughs> it gives up gives hard work. Yeah. <laughs> well that, that that's it mate it, it you know life everything in life becomes a lot harder as you get older and uh you know i never used to believe it but here i am in my 30s just kind of like no actually no it does <laughs> Um, obviously you mentioned uh, Sam Bailey and uh, Prince Pelé uh, shout out to those guys as well so I had uh, Pelé on last week I was lucky enough to get to talk oh he's a guy um, I love him genuine awesome human being so yeah. uh, I count myself very lucky with the people I thankfully everybody that I've had a chance to speak to I don't know if I've got a, just a genuine human 
nice filter, but I'm, I'm thankful enough to be able to speak to people. And everybody is just, yeah, really, really nice. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Pal, great guy. Um, obviously, a massive coffee connoisseur. So. Yeah, yeah, he is. Uh, is he, the, the thing with Pele is a genuine human being. Um, and he is as pure as he gets. Uh, such a beautiful soul. Uh, always got time for him. And, um, you know, he's another one. I remember the first time I ever saw Pele train uh, when I was training at Future Shock. And where he is now in that space of time, like this guy, he's going to be a star. He will be an absolute star. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'm trying to talk him into, you know, coming over to, to Yorkshire, coming over to Leeds, trying to. Uh, Planting the seeds, just talking to as much people as I can do. But like, like you get this guy, and you go. Every show in Leeds has a massive Pele hole sized. Yeah. Like, <laughs> on your show, dude, the dude's awesome. So, and again, there's so many other people as well. And that's the problem, I think, with British wrestling. It's not, it's not a problem with British wrestling, but the thing about British wrestling at the minute is, it's just, it's overburdened with talent. It's, and it's so peppered good. with so many amazing people right now um you know i know that people talk about the glory days of like you know 20 2015 to 2019 or whatever you know um and and they were amazing we did have a lot of now big names on the british scene but i think in terms of the amount sheer amount of talent i think we're in a better place now yes I fully agree. Um, I mean, obviously, those guys, yeah, they went on to do great things, obviously, like Pete Dunst, Tyler Bates, uh, Ospreys, you know, all those guys yeah. around for those sort of five years. Um, but I just think, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think, you know, obviously, I talk to guys from Pursuit a lot. You know, I think they're chilling out some amazing talent. You've got Future Shock chilling out some, you know, amazing talent. Uh, and there's countless schools in the country who are just churning them out. I just think, yeah. yeah you know, we've got we've got untapped endless supply of talent really. I know it's not endless, but you know what I mean, it feels like Yeah. It. Yeah, no, I agree. And you know, now we're we're also witnessing the younger generation now also get those big opportunities. Leon Slater and Harley Hudson, you know, Leon's still nineteen. I think Harley's twenty one. Uh she might kill me for that. She might be twenty, I can't remember. Um but you know, those two now that their life is made as long as they continue to do exactly what they've been doing and showing us what they can do over there the world is just going to be in the palm of their hands and uh yeah kudos to both of those they've worked i've been fortunate enough to see both of them numerous times at shows yeah yeah so you can just you could tell by looking at them you know they're very good at what they do and at such a young age as well it's ridiculous you know, it's like I'm talking. I talk to like the I call them the OGs, but like your RJs and your Stixers and your Haskins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking to those guys and talk about the current the current generation, I suppose. You know, it's like what they're doing at 18 or 19, it just blows the mind because it's like yeah. you know they were still not even set foot in a school at that point. Some you know some people. No, and you know I I still talk. L Leah does this a lot. Um, you know, she she's because she works so hard and she wants to climb the ladder as quick as possible. And I, and I always say to her, like, you know, take it one step at a time. DDP um, didn't start training until he was 34, won his first championship at 36, I think, was it? Or 35, 36. Um, you know, and it, it can be done. It, it age, you know, as long as you've got that gimmick and that charisma and you're able to get in there and do it at, at the right level then what's stopping you that's it and um i think i was speaking to i can't remember who was that said it now but oh yes i do hard man dan you know he's all about you know getting about wrestling uh and regardless of where you are on the ladder at any given point at least you're on the ladder yeah how cool, how cool is that yeah um, yeah spot on 100%. You know, the, the guy speaks facts. He's been in the business a while, so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, obviously, uh, you mentioned training at Future Shock. Um, was that just <coughs> a health thing, or did you actually thought, think, right, 
I, I could be a wrestler. I, I try and justify this to myself all the time. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I spoke to Sam and, you know, because of my commentary, I, I'm a person that doesn't, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. I always want to do better than that. So, you know, although I've just come off working OTT's biggest show of the year, that's still not enough. I want to do the next big thing. So I, even to, to this small detail, I originally wanted to go training to learn more about the psychology of the ring for my commentary, to be able to have a better connection with the guys in the ring. I'm being able to tell their story because I know what it takes for them to, to get to that level. Um, and I... <laughs> It was Leah Raven who took me training first at the Hunter's Gym down here. And then I said to her, I was like, look, I was like, I can introduce you to Sam Bailey. We can go to Future Shock. I was like, I know it's Manchester. It's quite far because we're in Birmingham. Um, but we'll we'll go for a drive. And uh, she's like, yeah, that's fine. Like, you know, we'll go up. So we did. And uh, we ended up going every week. <laughs> and we also trained at the hunters every week and i was still trying to tell myself that this is purely for research purposes what was really going on is that i got the bug and thought oh man i don't want to do commentary anymore (laughs) i'm enjoying being in the ring too much um and you know i loved it and look you know future shock is a very special place um and Sam Bailey will hate me for saying this because uh, he doesn't like compliments, but is for me the best coach in the country, or is, is definitely one of the best coaches this country has seen. Um, you know, I think the likes of him and HT Drake are in a league of their own. Um, I have still told sam bailey that next year at future shock i want to call a singles match between those two because that is that will main event any promotion in this country <laughs> like and if i get to call that man i don't even if i don't and that's on a card i will travel um because you've got two of the best minds in this business going at it yeah um but yeah you know future shock is, is a wonderful place it's a great environment it's a place where no question is a stupid question there's always an answer um and i think that is the exact way that you should be taught because there's no point in my personal opinion in you going to school to not be to not wonder and not get the answer to what you're wondering and those questions rather than being belittled or you know and it's about learning and it's about expressing yourself and future shot welcomes that in absolute bucket loads. Um, and you know, you, again, you had Lana Austin who was training the women. It's now Lizzie Evo. Uh, she puts on classes as well. Uh, Ridgeway as well when he's over. So you've got three of the best, you know, all teaching the new guys and even the vets that still train there you know there are vets that still go to train in there and um that's how special it is that that shows the mentality that future shock's got behind it that it doesn't matter how experienced you are those guys still want to train there and um yeah uh that was a really long answer to the question that didn't need any of that other than me saying yeah it was meant for research purposes but uh yeah i ended up i ended up enjoying it more than i thought and um you know taking bumps is is real and it's it's not a soft landing in that ring um but uh sadly the most stupidest of surgeries has put me on the sidelines for like two years now so i haven't been able to do anything um we're still in the process of getting it fixed, but it's it's silly and small and stupid, but at the same time, it could be risky if I tried to risk it on myself. So, 
it's not worth it. Uh, so at the moment, what that's given me is more of a platform and an opportunity to express on commentary, which, to be honest, I've had the best year of my life in wrestling this year on commentary and, uh, you know, silver linings. Yeah, well, that's it, you know. Um, obviously, yeah, don't risk it, you know, for just concentrate on what you're doing now. Like you said, you've silver lining is you've had a banging year on commentary. Um, obviously, you'll get back in the ring as of when possible. Don't, obviously, don't rush it. Don't do, don't do yourself any damage. Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, obviously, and don't apologise for the long answer. Yeah, any time, future shock. Get some love. It's perfectly fine. And HG Drake as well. You know, um, just love it when these guys get a shout out because it's just nice to hear other people's opinions. And uh, yeah, Bailey's had a few compliments. Uh, yeah, got obviously got some from the Prince last week, and now yourself. Yeah. So. People are going to realise that he's a human being in fairness. Yeah, you know, I've known Sam a very long time, longer than I have in wrestling. Uh, so we used to host gaming events together, but he would be on one stage and I'd be on another. And at the time, I didn't know he was in wrestling. So this is going back a while. And, um, you know, I remember I just hosted the Just Dance World Cup finals. And he was having on his stage was the final dance, like the big one for Ubisoft. So we went up and we chatted and, um, you know, thought nothing of it. And then my first day at TNT, like, that guy looks familiar. I'm sure I, I'm sure I was on stage with him at Insomnia. And he comes up and introduces himself. I'm like, oh, my, yeah. And and then, you know, the rest is history and now I'll commentate for his promotion. So, um, you know, and, and my girlfriend trains under under him and, uh, you know, it's 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 a full circle thing. But, you know, he is. Um, he's. There is I, I, I still don't understand how. Bailey isn't seen by. Others up and down the country as a main eventer everywhere. Uh, I, I don't get it personally um, because he is he is and he can carry a show on his shoulders easy um, but you know he, he still loves doing what he's doing and he's you know responsible for you know as you said earlier churning out some of these amazing talents you know uh, you know, and he, he has had a big, big hand in that. And and I still go to him for advice and stuff, even not in the ring, but more psychological or, you know, if it's show day stuff or if it's even behind the scenes stuff, I still go to him for advice. So uh, kind of touching back on what you're saying about, you know, taking the bumps and being in the ring um, to aid your commentary, you know, when you when that was the reason you thought you was doing it. Um, since though you after you did train, did you find that your commentary was more genuine because you <clears throat> you know to what was going on? You could actually feel the bumps when they were happening, kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you, you you get a more psychological viewpoint, so that allowed me to be able to sell the match very differently than I would if I hadn't been in the ring. Um, so. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, I mean, you'll probably hear me in, in some of my commentaries during some of those moves, especially, you know, towards the back end of matches. You will hear me react as if it's me taking the bumps, almost. You know, my 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 cadence will completely change, um, and delivery and diction will completely change to how it would be at the start of the match because I'm now selling the the hard end of the match, you know, and, and I know what those guys are feeling going into that. So yeah, again, you know, I think it, it helped a hell of a lot. And, um, you know, I, I still do attend training just to, to watch now and again, um, you know, very occasionally jump in with Leah if I don't want to sit on my PlayStation all night while she's sweating in a gym. Um, and, you know, I'll go up and, and watch those guys and, and it will also help me learn a bit as well because different things will be speak, spoke about. So, um, yeah, no, it did help a lot, a hell of a lot. So, um, you know, hopefully 
when I do end up getting back in, we'll we'll see where it goes from there. Nice. Uh, well, the Prince was on about the uh, Chris Ridgeway warm up last week. <laughs> the initiation. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's it's vile. It <laughs> is horrible. I tried to get Leah to do, but she wouldn't. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, did has Pele done it? Uh, well, no, he was well. Not so much. He was just on about. He was he was doing a warm up with Chris, and it was the four cards, you know, four suits. Oh yeah, yeah. And he was just like, "I'll just do whatever you do." Uh, so he was just like four of the hardest things going, and then like literally the week after, he was just like, "I'll do my own thing," and he just did like arm rotations, <laughs> squats, <laughs> like pick four of the easiest things possible, and apparently that's it. Now Chris was just like, "Dude, you're such a wuss." Yeah. Yeah, literally. Um, so there's d- doing a, ge- a a Chris Ridgway class in general. Now I've not done one, but I've attended one. Um, and Leah came out of it just like I've never been so gassed in my life. Like, um, and who was it now? Oh man. Um. I can't quite remember who it was. It was a member of the Future Shot roster. Um, so, Ridgeway has got an initiation. Um, what do I call it? Like a sequence uh, where basically, for however many minutes straight, you're running ropes, then you're taking bump after bump after bump, no rest up to your feet, bump, up to your feet, bump. Then it's clothesline, it's a clothesline, it's a clothesline. Like, and this goes on for four straight minutes or something like this. Um, and our Senna, that's who it was, Senna. And now Senna is a very athletic, very quick, energetic dude. Like, And even by the end of this, he was struggling to get to his feet and he had big guns, Joe, like helping him up to his feet. Come on, you've got like 30 seconds left, come on. Um, and it was hard to watch, man, because it was just like, I would do it. I would love to try it. I, I would get absolutely battered. Um, but I was just like, man, this is like some hardcore initiation stuff. But like in a fun way, it was done, you know, really fun. And, um, you know, if if uh, I, I would I would love to challenge myself to try and do that, you know, to take those bumps from Ridgeway and Joe and, and people like that. Definitely seems like uh, you know, once you've done it, it's something to brag about. It's like, yes, oh yeah, I've passed. You know, I've done the uh, the Ridgeway challenge kind of, or the Ridgeway sequence, we'll call it. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's like you know, PC people walk around with like a tough mudder t-shirt on. It's like ah, that little bit of you know. Yeah, 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 and and I think that's it. You know, th- there's not many people that have put themselves through that that um, challenge. Uh, but you, you're absolutely right to, to walk away and go, no, I, I, I did it. So, yeah, it's definitely a bragging right. And, um, you know, like afterwards, like when Senna took his last bump, you know, all the guys, I can't, there's, it wasn't Ethan Kelly, I don't think. Somebody else was also giving bumps. But, um, yeah, you know, they all got round Senna and was like, well done, congratulations. And it was a big moment, so it's pretty cool. Awesome. Um, obviously, yeah, well, talk to Future Shock. I'm just going to bring it a little bit closer to home for myself. Uh, I know uh, you're not doing the commentary there anymore, but you did. Um, how did you find your time at True Grit? Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, you know, True Grit. So I did one live show and then one post. And I reached out to James um, recently, only a couple of weeks ago. Um, and due to my schedule, you know, we just couldn't make it work all the time. And I said to him, like, you know, I only expect my schedule to either be the same or even worse next year. I said, like, you know, I'm a constant, I've always been so proud of my professionalism. And I said, I don't want to be someone who lets people down. Um, so, you know, I stepped away from true grit out of, you know, thought for him and not giving him that extra stress so he can just rely on a commentary team who knows he's going to be there every show. Um, and and it was great, you know, and James is such a great guy and he gets the business. I think that's important. He really understands the business. Um, 
I, apart from North, I don't think I've ever seen a well organized, meticulously detailed promotion in this country. Um, I remember being so shocked because James messaged me was like, oh, I've, I've got this for you. Um, just so you know what's going on at the next show. It was commentary notes. And I was so confused because I'm so used to having to sit down with the guys backstage and go, right, what's going on? Blah, blah. Um, and he just like sent all these notes over and I was just like, man, this is, this is awesome. This is amazing. Um, but yeah, no, really, really good promotion. Ran super, super well. And the crowd are incredible there. Uh, that church venue is special. Um, but yeah, you know, I I was very proud to be a small part of the crown in the first TGW women uh, women's match. Uh, that that championship was yeah, it was it was just mental, wasn't it? It was insane. Um, uh, you know, some of the comms that myself and Isaiah Queen came out with on that match still makes me chuckle. Um, uh, but yeah, they are. They're great. And do you know what? I So because of how professional I can be and anyone who's been in a comms booth with me or a studio can can attest to this. I when I'm when I'm in a work environment, I'm in work mode. Um you know, Leah kind of, yeah, she stays away from me as well. Like, cause she just, I'm just like, just leave me alone. I've got stuff to do. Um, <laughs> you know, and, um, I, even when jokes are made during matches and things like that, I still keep a professional response or, you know, structured at least Mark Adams as been trying to break me and make me corpse for the last two years. Anyway, so myself and Isaiah are calling uh, Commander Stephanie Sterling and Kid Bandit's match. <laughs> and then I, 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 it was when the door was introduced into the match and I reeled off this fact that this goes back to Commander Stephanie Sterling's days. Um, I think it was in, in Texas or somewhere, um, because that's where that they use doors, not tables. So it was it was kind of like a throwback uh, fact. And then Isaiah tells this joke. He's like, "Do you want to hear my best not knock joke?" I went, "Sure." He's like, "Say not knock." I went, "Not knock." He went, "Who's there?" <laughs> I was so confused. Well, at that time, that was the joke, by the way. That that, and, and I didn't get it. <laughs> so I'm trying to hold this together, but then, <laughs> then the baby shark wrapped in barbed wire got introduced, and I lost it. I, you can hear me on commentary, absolutely lose it. And you can hear me put my headset down. So I took it off because I was hysterically laughing. And Isaiah actually says on commentary, Simon's gone. Simon's lost it. And that is the only time um, I have ever corpsed during comms. And it was at True Grit. And I'm glad that if anywhere it was there and it was during that match. Because that is, I've never called a match like that in my life. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Um, it, it I, I, I still don't know what it was. Um, there was a spot in it where Kid Bandit goes for a coast to coast, holding the bar by a shark, but doesn't use it. So on commentary, you just hear me say, "Why did they have the shark? Because they're just holding a bar by a shark." Um, so it was. Uh, a, a really interesting match to call that one but um again a lot of fun and you know uh without burying his gimmick so much um you know working with somebody who's got the timing that isaiah quinn has you know guiding light is a force to be reckoned with you know i'm looking forward to his christmas roast this year uh you know as he, as the entirety of british wrestling is but he's um 
yeah it's um you know having having somebody who can keep you on your toes like that you know it's uh it makes it a little bit more challenging a bit more fun for sure well, that's it. I mean, that's you think about any commentary team kind of thing. You need it's always a, basically a good commentary team is a, a good double act. You know, you've got to have that back and forth. You've got to have somebody that you can feed off of um, and just keep you entertained as well, keep you focused. So, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And you know, you're working as a team, and I'll keep this as light as possible. <laughs> um, there are commentators out there that that put themselves over too much rather than, you know, our job as a commentator is to put the talent over in the ring, put the match over, you know, sell that. Um, you know, my my job as a commentator is to make you look good. It's to, to, to be the voice of what people are watching and to tell your story and put you over. Uh, there are commentators out there who don't think like that. And, you know, they... You know, will scream or swear to get a cheap pop, or you know, just just not tell the story of the match, and that does, you know, it does it does put a dampener down on the actual role itself. And then you've got people like Mark Adams, like Isai Quinn, you know, Geo, who I recently did OTT with, Angus from Ireland, uh, Angus McAnally is the most phenomenal person I've ever worked with on commentary. Uh, Jamie Coleman as well in uh, at OTT. But, you know, there are really, really, really talented commentators out there. A, a, a quick shout out to Lucy Simons as well, who is very new to it all. Um, but I got to call the Odyssey Pro Wrestling Women's Championship match with her at the last show where Leah Raven won it. And... Um, Lucy is going to be one of those people that you listen to because you want to listen to. And um, she, her knowledge is, you know, I I always pride myself on being really knowledgeable, really well researched, but her knowledge, like I was just so wowed whilst we were on comms together. Um, so she's already got that element of it you know and she's getting that delivery side and where to come in and how to sell things not to pop for a wrist lock or you know scream for a chop you know you 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 build that story you you react the way the fans would react um in terms of the story you know so as a fan i'm not gonna go oh my god a wrist lock you're just not gonna, like so why on commentary would i do it yeah. you know um so again it's it's knowing how to, to to do that and lucy already is is learning that very quickly and and she's she's very good um you know and i i remember asking this question because i did sirens fury which is obviously a new all women's promotion from the the guys behind tnt and um you know, I, I spoke to to Lizzie and because she she helps run it uh, between her, uh, Alex Rio and Lucy Sky. Um, and I, I said to, to Lizzie, I was like, you know, like, thank you. Like, so grateful that you've got me in. But is there a reason why you didn't get a female commentator in? And at the time, there was a few of us, a few talent. And... Um, she turned around and was like, you know, because we know that you're very good at your job and we want really good commentary on the show. So, you know, I've I've been and watched interviews. I've been involved in interviews where talent have said they haven't shared footage of what they consider some of their best matches because the commentary is bad. Wow. Uh, you know, and I'm talking about, you know, talent that we watch on tv um you know i remember speaking to matt cardona once and he said that he had this incredible match at g was it gcw or was it south it was one of the south texas south i can't it, it was one of those but it was a different commentary team to what they usually have and um and he said it was one of his favourite matches of the year. 
and he didn't share any of it because the commentary was shit in his opinion in his words yeah Wow, that's but yeah. I mean, but the thing is though, with commentary, um, obviously you can attest to this. I, I, I presume from being on this side, um, that it's something you kind of have to learn on the job. You know, you can't go to commentary or you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that you know, there there isn't commentary school. I think what what I was fortunate enough to have in my locker was I started my whole broadcasting career in professional radio, so. Although that's not calling live matches, I know how to work a mic. I know how to express myself in a correct way. I know how to structure things because on live radio, again, it's live, you know, to millions of people. You have to structure things in a certain way. You have to be well researched. You have to be ready for anything. Um, so I think that helped me. But as for actually calling live matches, it is very different and it is very much learn on the job. There are ways that you can get ahead of yourself, you know, do this, get a microphone, get attitude error, up, get get whatever, your favourite matchup, commentate it, you know, and record it, listen back, figure out where you should have told a story a bit different, figure out those, where you get your facts in, you know, if there's if there's a double down and you know or, or there's there's a, a quieter moment, that's where you come in with a nice bit of storytelling or you know a fact about each opponent. You know you don't just go silent because they have. Uh, you know you, you've got an opportunity here. Um, and sometimes what I tend to do, and I was actually taught this uh, by Rob Halden, um, Future Shock as well his last show for them is in december so definitely go and watch that um but he i i was always comfortable anyway but there are always little transitions that you can you know pick up or learn or adapt to and he said one thing i tend to do whether it's like a double down or something something's just happened and and the energy's being brought back down to reset before the, they come up for the second half of the match is if it's a title match, for example, there'll be that big explosive sequence, then the double down, and he'll go, now don't forget what's at stake here, the Future Shock Championship. And this is what it means to both men. You bring it down with the with the crowd, and it sets that tone back up because you then build up for the end of the match. And I've heard certain people do it, Another way where it's like, oh my god, they're both down on the mat. What? what? It's just like, why? Yeah. You, you, like, your energy now has got to try and exceed that for the finish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where where are you going to go apart from popping a vein? Um, so you know, it's something I was taught by Kevin Kelly as well is that he, you know, he's a firm believer in in keeping a flow. Of, of a match and that you that you tell that story within that flow and by the end of it you're up here and then after the bell rings you kind of plateau and you know it just it made so much sense to me that when you structure these matches and you you do plateau at the end your your energy is up because of what you've just witnessed and again you've told that story and it's so so important well i say i think the key thing that you the way that you put it is is you you tell a story as as a fan you know you match the pace yeah you know, yeah uh you react to stuff as you would react to if you was a fan kind of thing uh um, yeah that's that's not to be understated. It sounds like really it's really obvious, but it's as you say, it, some people don't grasp that, or some people try to go OTT with it, or mm. it just if you're like you said, if you're screaming for the smallest thing, you can't go any higher than that for you know like the really big moments. You know the big moments, the big moments lose their impact. Yeah, yeah. You can't tell it well enough. Yeah, absolutely spot on. And you know, I also think it's important that you're bouncing off your commentary partner because you'll both have a different dynamic so with mark adams i don't even need to look at mark for a reaction he just knows where i am and i know where he is and i know where he can come in and he knows where i can he knows that 
you know, uh, and, and it's the same with Angus McAnally. Oh, man. I'd... So we knew of each other the first time we ever did OTT together. Obviously, we'd never worked together. And we're both very much lead commentators. So it's kind of like, how does this dynamic work? The second we got going was like we'd been commentating for five years. Um, although, you know, I very much knew this was his gig and I was his colour almost. It was very much a shared experience. Um, you know, I would have more of the story beats um, and, you know, natural reactions, whereas he would finish off the moves and stuff like that. So it was just meant to be when you've got chemistry like that instantly with people, uh, you know, I think it, it becomes very, very special. And working with Gio at the last OTT again, so Joey Cabray messaged me and asked me who if I could get anyone for comms because Angus wasn't available because he's an actor, he's a theatre actor, he's doing theatre over there at the moment. So I wasn't able to make it over to Wolverhampton's show. And so I got Geo because I knew Geo, I'd heard Geo was very good. I saw some stuff on him and I thought he was good. Uh, obviously did stuff with Rev Pro, um, you know, he's doing stuff with Chaos now as well. And, uh, you know, I thought like this this would be a really cool dynamic and we I, I think that show so I came away really emotional from that show um last month because I'd been told a few things from talent about people abroad internationally mentioning my name. And um I remember having a bit of a sub to Leah about it and uh, I came away from that show just feeling so accomplished and complete and you know I always beat myself up I'm the first person to criticize myself but I remember messaging my sister and I said to her, I said, do you know what? For the first time in five years of working in this business, I'm going to say something that's going to shock you. And she went, right. I said, I absolutely can belong here. I was like, that is the best work I've ever done. And do you know what? I'm proud of myself. And no longer am I going to criticise my own work because do you know what? No one's doing what I'm doing right now. If if wrestler, if talent can go out there and say they're the best, why can't I? Because I have just, for five years, blood, sweat and tears, and lots of tears, um, fought my way through this business. I've had the best year I've ever had. I've just called the biggest show this side of Europe in six to seven years. I mean, we had John Moxie on the card. You know, Kenta, GYV's first show back after the States. And I listened back to it and I just said, there is no British commentator doing this, what I'm doing right now. And although that sounds a little forward, you know, overconfident, I think if you put it into context of I am always the first person to just beat myself up, criticise myself never talk that way it's very different it's actually more of a realization of going do you know what i'm working bloody hard for this you don't say it all the time uh you don't shout it from the rooftops it's like i said it's a realization that you've like you had you've been doing this for five years the time the effort you know the research the hard work it's paid off the pennies dropped and you just had the epiphany yeah. Oh, yes, I am that damn good. And I'm going to say it once and I'm going to mean it, but I'm not going to keep saying it because that's when you become a bit of a <laughs> egotistical. So I'm going to say it once, I'm going to mean it, and you're going to be spot on as well because, yeah, dude, give you your flowers, mate. It, it is, it is genuinely correct. Oh, mate, I appreciate that. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you, man.
Um, I have just clocked the time. We have gone over the hour mark. So nice. <laughs> I flew the flow by. I would love to keep chatting, uh, but I have to uh, stay within the time frame today, unfortunately. So no worries. Hit uh, shout out. Where can people come see you or you know find uh, out the social? Yeah, sure. So um, my last show of the year is Future Shock on the twenty sixth of November, I think. <laughs> Uh, let me look. Yeah, Sunday. Sunday the 26th of November. Three days for a flight to Mexico. That's going to be my last show of the year. Um, it's also Lee Raven's last one. She's going against Tonga. Um, however, just come for the card. I mean, it's a stack card. It's going to be an amazing show. You've finally got that payoff with Tony Wright and Bright Strong. That's going to be awesome. Harley Hudson uh, and Lily Winter. Obviously, they were a tag team last time out. So now, because Harley has disrupted the... You know, the locker room, uh, Lily Winter wants to get her shot in on that that championship. Um, so, you know, it's going to be a really, really big show. Um, and as for socials, Simon H. Official everywhere. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Uh, Simon H. Official, and that's me. Um, after this week, you'll just get a lot of photos of me in Mexico, to be honest. Uh, no wrestling content. I'm done with it. I've I've literally littered and peppered my socials with wrestling content for a whole year. <laughs> Dude, as long as we get to you in a sombrero, I'll be more than happy. Hey, man, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it for the gram. <laughs> Dude, uh, thank you so much for talking. Obviously, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Hit like, hit share, hit subscribe, leave a comment, and keep your eyes peeled. Because, uh, yeah, for more guests, announcements, and stuff that's coming. So, thank you so much for watching, and we will see you again very soon. <sighs>